Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, I'm Sam Shonkoff. I'm one of the faculty members in the Richard S. Dinner Center for Jewish Studies here at the GTU, and really honored to be convening this program in collaboration also with our Center for Islamic Studies at the GTU. Um, Ramadan Mubarak to those who are celebrating, and um, I just want to also be attuned to the fact that with this 3.30 program. Uh, we didn't want to do a lunch program for obvious reasons, but also, of course, want not wanting to do an evening program to not conflict with Iftar, and recognizing that this is, I'm sure, a, um, a deep time of the fast. So, from the Karim, welcome, welcome to everybody to this program. Um, these are uh, excruciating times um, of uh, social, political, moral, spiritual uh, disaster and, and outrage. Um, and one of the things that uh, is powerful, I think, about what we do here at the GTU and in places of scholarship and academic context is one of the things that we do is uh, try to also think broadly about uh, where we are, how did we get here? <laughs> um, what are the histories? What are the lenses that have been operating? What are the lenses that have been forgotten um, that are crucial for approaching this time? Um, what are ideologies? What are cultural frames uh, that have been dominant, that have been marginalized, that have been silenced? Um, how are different identities at play? And um, there, is, there are few scholars out there right now who I would be more um, eager to listen to um, in, in, in that vein of navigating this moment than Professor Santiago, Santiago Slabotsky, uh, who's joining us here. Um, and I'll, I'll do a bit of, of bio here. Um, Santiago is, is really a cutting edge scholar um, within Jewish studies and thinking about decolonial theory and, po and liberation theologies um, and in intercultural encounters. He holds the Florence and Robert Kaufman Endowed Chair in Jewish Studies at Hofstra University in New York, um, where he serves as professor of religion and was the inaugural associate director of the Center for the Study of Race, Culture, and Social Justice. He's the co-director of the trilingual um, journal Decolonial Horizons, core faculty of Jewish-Muslim relations at the Critical Muslim Studies Program of the Global Dialogue Center in Spain, um, where he actually, I was just speaking with him before, where some of the ideas in this talk uh, have, have been sort of incubating um, in his teaching there for, for years at this point, but also tailored to this moment we're in at, uh, right now and has been concurrent visiting professor in institutions in Latin America, Africa, and Europe. Among his publications is his book, Decolonial Judaism, Triumphal Failures of Barbaric Thinking, which if you haven't read it yet, is a deeply um, impactful, groundbreaking work in the field. Um, that book received the Franz Fanon Outstanding Book Award by the Caribbean Philosophical Association. Um, Santiago's talk today is entitled Contesting Eternal Enmity, How Decolonial Theory Can Help to Reevaluate Jewish-Muslim Relations. I also just want to note that we have these cameras here to record the talk. We will be shutting down all recording for the Q&A. Um, and so those on Zoom, those in our audience here today, um, I just want you to rest assured that, uh, that we'll have time also to discuss to ask questions and be in direct conversations, uh, conversation with Santiago in a way that will not be recorded in any way. Please join me in welcoming Professor Slabotsky. I just want to thank everyone for who make this possible, starting with uh, with Ben, with Munir, um, and also Benjamin, who actually has helped. So sorry, Sam, <laughs> Munir, and Benjamin, who helped us as well. You know, well, you know, we can. I, I can try to justify it. Probably I won't. You know, I won't be able to. For everyone who is joining us online, I'm very sorry to say it is a beautiful day today in California. You know, I'm sorry you are not with us. You know, and those who are still in my hometown in New York, I'm sorry for the cold there. 
Uh, probably you haven't noticed at all, but I kind of have a slight accent. So instead of doing my best to buy for myself some titles, which you know, uh, still haven't been able to acquire them yet, I brought my own subtitles in the form of a PowerPoint. So let me start a little bit with some images, I think. Yes, there we are. And I just want to start how popular culture is most of the time representing today Jewish-Muslim relations. Most of the time we are going to see in the media a radical cause for the extermination of what is considered to be an other, or you are going to see in the TikTok, Facebook, or Twitter world, this kind of hidden histories that need to be unveiled. And I want to start from this space of popular culture, because this is what permeates discussions today. And the question is how to interpret these images. And I would say there are multiple ways of doing it. I will just focus particularly on three, and my talk is going to be about this last one. There is one, one uh, interpretation that until very recently I would have called conservative, but today I will call reactionary. And this understand that there is an enmity between Jews and Muslims from biblical times. And I just love the idea that Isaac looks older than Ishmael. You know, and the question is, what is implied with those images? Uh, you know, that is something to discuss later. Um, and this today, in modernity, this confrontation of eternity in biblical times is represented as the fight between, on the one hand, Western civilization, represented by Jews, and on the other hand, Oriental barbarism, as represented by Muslims. Many times, this narrative has been mobilized even by white supremacists, who are both anti-Semitic and Islamic forces, but they still are arguing that they are defending the war from anti-Semitism. We have seen this particular in the discussions in the US Congress today. A second possibility is a liberal interpretation of this. This liberal interpretation confirms that historically there has been some problems between Muslims and Jews. Some of them will even argue there was an eternal enmity, but today, since we have the common ground of modern rationality, we are able to find a common denominator to just get along. This common denominator, which is these textual studies or ritual studies, lead to the possibility of finding in each other some humanity, which is a wonderful project. But the question is, what happened with the reasons of why the enmity was created? Is something that many times the liberal reading doesn't account for. So today I'm going to emphasize in this last reading, the decolonial. I will explain a little bit more why decolonial is later, but for now I'm going to ask what questions this interpretation will be asking. The decolonial interpretation will interrogate how, when, and why this enmity was constructed, what interest has served, and how this analysis is not only an empirical positivistic analysis, but also it has to confront the racial hierarchies that currently dominate the world. And this is why I am going to make my, hopefully, offer my two cents today. Some questions answered will arrive today. The first one is, I know I am a spoiler here, but I want to tell you the answer before going through the whole talk, but I just think it's important to see where we are going with this. The first one is, the question is, is this hatred a term from biblical times? I will say it is not. It is actually only between 75 and 150 years, and its consequence of Western designs far in North Africa and later in the Middle East that can go globalize and neutralize. What has been historically the relation? And I will argue that before we talk about a Judeo-Christian tradition, there was a Judeo-Islamic tradition. Once that is said, the mobilization of what is called the Judeo-Islamic or the Judeo-Christian is a political mobilization. Every time we argue for historical fact, actually we are mobilizing selectively some arguments to justify a political project. And today, without any, um, uh, any concern, I will mobilize a political project here. So what I'm going to say here is that all political, all entities, 
even what is the Jewish people, what is the, uh, the Christian Ecclesia, what is Islamic Ummah are political projects. And as such, we need to acknowledge what we are doing. Third, are Jews and Muslims two sides of a global conflict? I would say that they are not the only two sides. There is one side that, as Hill Gottschberg, Gottschberg said, is a side that is too big to be seen. That is the West. And I will explain how the West has profited from conflict over peace. How, why, and when. And finally, is Zionism representative of all Jews and the Palestinian National Movement representative of all Muslims? I will say that these representations may dance near not only uniformization, but also repression in between. For example, in the case of Zionism, before the 1940s, political Zionism was a small minority among Jews. Even after the case of, of Israel, was not an hegemonic project, which is only going to become after the 1960s. And as such, the Jewish people have always been diverse. And even though Zionism is one Jewish political project, it's one of many. And we need to acknowledge that each political project has consequences, and Zionism is one of them. Now, the question is why I am talking about decolonization. I am sure all of you have heard this word out there. And the question is sometimes when I have been working with this for some time, when people are actually using the word decolonization, I really don't know what people are talking about. It's too many things at the same time. And the colonization seems to be, at some point, part of a jargon. And I will not discard that sometimes is the case, but it also can be a particular pers perspective that can be particularly insightful. Most of the time, when two people talk about decolonization or decolonialism, they are talking about multiple theoretical frameworks which are non competitive but at the same time are different. For example, postcolonial theory. Subartic studies, settler colonial studies, native studies, critical theory of race, and studies of modernity coloniality. Today, I am going to focus particularly in this last one. Not because I don't use elements of the other, but I believe that this particular perspective will be uh, particularly nourishing to discuss what we need to discuss today. And what is one of the central components, central concepts that the coloniality or the studies of modernity coloniality are going to provide is the concept of coloniality. What is coloniality? Coloniality are the patterns of domination that they were generated in colonial location and colonial times that has been globalized and naturalized well beyond the space and the time of that colonization. What I will argue very, very soon is that the world we live today is based on certain racial hierarchies, and the racial hierarchies are a product of this coloniality. So I'm going to start from a symbolic time, a symbolic year, 1492, when Jews and Muslims were expelled from the first modern empire, and also is the arrival and later on annihilation and conquest of Europeans in the Americas and also that opened the possibility for the major extension of the slave trade, which was kidnapping people in Africa and transporting those people as merchandise. What we're going to say is that this is a symbolic point in which the Western world, as we are starting today, existed. So why I started this 1492? During this 1492, as I said before, there was a simultaneous, two simultaneous conquests. The Iberian Peninsula and the Americas. And this is when the West started to become a global power that at some point by 1914 will have occupied over 80% of the world and influenced in 100. And the question is how a population that was never more than 12%, most of the time around 8% of the world, or even a little bit less, has been able to create this global expansion not only at the political, but also the cultural level, imposing its racial hierarchies all around. And it is true that they have done it through the resources they have taken from some places and collaboration from people from this place as well. 
but especially because they were able to structure a world according to what was at the beginning racial thinking, as Irán Silverblatt explained, and later on racial hierarchies. And I want to explain why I want to speak about this here at GTU. One of the few places where actually the Center for Islamic Studies and the Center for Jewish Studies can co-sponsor this, interrogating a little bit what is the role of Christian theology in this construction. In the 16th to 17th century, there was a construction of the world according to a tripartite idea of how racial hierarchies were going to be developed. And this was based largely in Christian theology. A group of people, Christians, who first of all are going to be Catholics and later on are going to be Protestants, are going to be considered the true religion. And why this is important? Because this community will be endowed with the ultimate truth to bring the world to religious salvation. Then, passing the time, will be to bring the world to cultural civilization, economical development, and as people in the Arab and Muslim world today know very well about political democratization. Not because there is nothing wrong with civilization, economic development, or political democratization, but the problem is that there was only one path, and everyone needed to follow one path. That was the Western one. There was a second group of people who are considered people with a false religion. These are communities who were understood as having chosen the wrong path, a consciously rejected or betrayed ultimate truth, and either they were stuck in time or actively working against civilization with open wars, largely considered for Muslims, or conspiracies, largely considered for Jews, but not only. As such, the violence is going to be an imperial difference. Not because these communities were always empires. Some Muslims were, most of the time Jews were not, but because they were going to be seen as uh, rivals in the conquest of the world. In the 15th, 16th century, the possibility of transforming this religious difference into racial hierarchies is what is going to be called the genealogical turn. The genealogical turn that happened a little bit earlier, but is going to be extended by this time, is the idea that it doesn't matter how much someone will try to convert to Christianity, there is always going to have an impure blood that will make them unable to do so. So this genealogical turn, this idea that there is something in your ancestry that doesn't allow you to actually become something else, is going to be a turn that's going to happen at this time. This is going to be the ground for posterior orientalism. It's going to be a turn that has to do with the ancestry of these people, and they are going to present it as competition. And there's a third group of people who are going to consider people with no religions. These people, who have spiritualists, who have their lives, but they will be considered by the system as having no religion, are going to be communities that are considered, who, uh, considered having fell off from a Christian map, and they did not have any participation in history until they encountered the true religion. And as such, the resources from land to labor to even the humanity, especially thinking about uh, about, about sexual slavery, are going to be virgin territories to fulfill the divine election, later on transforming time as historical destiny or natural selection. Their violence is not going to be necessarily competitive like the previous group, but is con 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 reactive, violence stemming from ignorance, because they have a limited understanding, a limited rationality of the historical role that the true religion plays. And as such, it's not going to imply an imperial difference, but a colonial difference. This was justified racially not by a genealogical term, but by an ontological term, starting to question the humanity of these people. By questioning the humanity of largely people who are, uh, we consider today natives or we consider today Africans, are going to actually have a second turn, which is going to constitute the central hierarchies of modern racism. The combination between the ontological and the genealogical turn. 
So where Jews and Muslims are placed here? Before 1492, Jews have been living among Arabs and later on among Muslims, some Arabs, some Noms, between 2,500 years, this one's in Babylon, to 700 years, more or less, in North Africa. Has virtually every historian, which I am not, but I admire them, will tell you that most of the time they have lived much better under Islam than under Christianity because they have a very clear legal status, which was Al-Kitab or people of the book, and it was transmitted into Dimi or Simet in Turkish. And as such, in the 15th and 16th century, where Jews have been expelled from Christian lands, they question where they went. It is true some of them made their way to the Americas, and still an area that needs to be researched more and more. But most of them went to North Africa and well into uh, the Ottoman Empire. And why this is important? Sometimes we forget that in 1453, the Ottomans took over uh, Constantinople and now Istanbul. As such, many Christians fled those areas and the Ottomans need to repopulate the cities. Who was used to repopulate the cities? Multi populations, among them Jews. What I'm saying with this? I am saying that we need to understand that until at least the 17th, 18th century, the lands of Islam were considered a space of refuge for Jews escaping persecution. That doesn't mean there were no problems. I'm going to get back very soon. But there was a clear legal status, and Jews were fleeing Christian land from Muslim lands. And as such, between the 16th and 18th century, the Jewish population of the Ottoman Empire, there are different estimations, but believe me on this because you know, I am a historian, but different estimations that has reproduced by eight times. I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of babies, but it's not enough to justify this representation. So something about the eternal hatred started to break down here. If Islam was a space for Jewish refugees, is Jews between 16th and 18th century, not such a long time ago, multiplied by eight times, something else is happening. What was happening? At the same time that Jews were fleeing in Christian European thinking, there has been a permanent construction of Jews and Muslims as part of the same structure. Could be through Orientalism, through Semitism, through uh, different kind of descriptions that actually will change with time. Most of the time, there has been a co-racialization between Jews and Muslims. When Edward Said finished Orientalism a few miles from there in a university I will not mention because it's the rival of Berkeley, but still, he finished not far away from here. He writes that anti-Semitism, and as I have discussed in Islamic branch Orientalism, resemble each other very closely in a historical, cultural, and political truth that needs only to be mentioned to a Palestinian for its irony to be perfectly understood. What I is trying to say here is that there is something that has, should provoke historical irony and we are not catching it. So he talked about the sacred entanglement between one and the other, we can describe and can be contested, but there is something there that is historically accurate. It's not the whole truth, but it's also part of the truth. So I want to repeat, this, this is for me very important, uh, as having in my own background, different families who had need to flee from Europe, later on from Latin America, and in different territorial spaces, I would just say that there was a space for refuge of Jews, well into, I will even call it, 19th century. Muslim lands in the Maghreb to the other large part of the Ottoman Empire, we are lands of refuge for Jews. I want to make something clear because I am sure that this comes once and again. People are asking, but Jews were not first-class citizens. That is true. They were not citizens in the Ottoman Empire. 
Okay, it's just a start. So, so it's important not to bring certain nation, modern Western nation, uh, um, uh, nation state structures into a different construct, first of all, to be said. And second, why I am saying that, as Ella Shohat said very well, Jews were an integral part of the fabric of Muslim society. It's because we are going to see Jews at every strata of economical, political, and cultural uh, dimensions of the Islamic Muslim societies. And this is why it's important. It's because being a Jew or not being a Jew did not dictate what place you have in the cultural, political, economical hierarchy. And this is what I'm saying is that it is not a full citizenship, but it's not a citizenship, but they, it's not that they have no problems, they were problems, but they were internal part, they were natural part of the Islamic, the fabric of the Islamic society. So, something changed. How we can think about all this history when we know what is happening right now? When it changed, how and why? For this, I will start talking about the 19th century. We are in the 1830s, the French Empire extends itself into what is North Africa today and practice a very typical divide and conquer strategy. In different parts of the world, French speaking, some French, Belgians and others, uh, but especially the French population is going to elevate a minority as collaborationists with imperial designs. This happened with Jews, especially in Algeria, less in Tunisia, and very, very little in Morocco, but also happened with Christian cops in Egypt. And you will tell me, well, they we are closer to European ideal. Well, it happened also with Tutsis in Rwanda, where they made them into closer to Europeans, but that was a social construction. There was nothing of the physiognomy who will make them being. It was a social construction. So we are going to be seeing that different empires, the French especially, but not only, has elevated some population over others, creating a distinction, offering the possibility of this population of accessing what they call universal knowledge, which was French, or education, or different kind of possibilities that other people didn't have. I will insist that even then, even when this process in the 1830s, and for example, Jews acquired citizenship, French citizenship in the 1870 in, 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 in Algeria, which by the way is less than half of the total Jewish of the Maghreb, but we all talk about Jews in Algeria as the ideal type when they were almost as double in Morocco than in Algeria, and we are for Tunisia and Libya. But even then, even with this imposition, the ties that I was talking before, they were not broken until well into the 20th century. I will call it even after the Nakba and after the Swiss crisis. Let me go a little bit more into this. Between the 80s, 80s and the 50s, 60s, they were having major movements of political decolonization through the Muslim world and also in this space in North Africa. The ties I was speaking before, they were never cut. Because even though many Jews did accept the advantages that the empire was giving, many of us would have done the same. I am an Argentinian professor in the US. I kind of did the same. Many of them engaged in political struggles with the other others. For example, in 1880, Yakut Sanua, or Sanu, who was the leader of uh, a particular uh, newspaper called uh, Abu Nadara, coined the term Egypt for Egyptians. This is very important. Yakut Sanu is a Jew. Why a Jew will coin the term Egypt for Egyptians if he doesn't believe himself as an Egyptian? Make sense? <laughs> yeah. If Jews are as most of the time, normative readings say, always outsider, why would we be coining this? Okay, well, if we look at the history, 
we can explain something, but if we look at the present, perhaps we are missing this. In the 1940s, 70 years later, Mohammed V, who is going to become king, is going to call for a Muslim Jewish Berber national movement in Morocco. This happened during the Holocaust. In Iraq, we know there was a very ancient Jewish community, and they did have the possibility of becoming, uh, of, of, of um, uh, being educated because of the particularities of Iraq, and they were civil servants until well into the 1930s, 1940s. And you will say, well, this is all happened in the global south. What about Europe? Let me talk about the case of Albania. Albania finished the Holocaust with five more time Jews that it started. Why? Jews escaping from Germany, from Poland, Austria, and Serbia found refuge among Muslim families. It is true that we're talking about small numbers. You know, we're talking about millions. True. But at the same time, that shows that there is a different kind of relationship going on there. The Albanian Muslims were practicing a particular rule they call Besa or to welcome the foreigners and take care of them, and they practice this with Jews there. If there is an eternal enmity, all these cases don't make sense. I'm not saying that Jews and Muslims always get along everywhere all the time. I'm saying that these cases describe the idea of eternal enmity everywhere all the time. So the eternal hatred is not eternal. You know, has been generated originally for colonial reasons. And some people took advantage of it. That doesn't mean that the ties were cut. It has been only naturalized in the last 70 years. It's a colonial fabrication, and I invite us a little bit to think a new relation that is not going to be a liberal pacification by acknowledgement of historical actions, the interests that we are in play in collaborations with Western imperialism. Okay? Not talking about Israel Palestine yet, but I am. So, what happened? In 1948, as M. Cesar said, an empire in complete decadence is going to try to assuage its guilt. There was a need to occlude the Judeo Islamic tradition in order to construct the Judeo Christian. This Judeo Christian is going to be presented as an alternative to two big enemies. First of all, Islam, even though we're not going to see it until after the, end of the, the Cold War, especially communism. The Judeo Christian tradition was about trying to occlude any possibility, any possibility that spaces where Jews have been very active, communism, socialism on the one hand, or the Jew Islamic on the other, will be able to participate using the Holocaust to demonstrate who was responsible for the Holocaust, which was the Western world. This is a moment in which Israel uproots Jews from what they consider dangerous spaces in the Balkan, the Maghreb, and the Middle East. Palestinians were expelled, put under a colonial regime. Arab Jews, many of the Arab Jews become what they call Arab Jews, I'm sorry, Arab Jews. Uh, so Arab Jews become second class citizens of the Jewish state once they were uprooted. And there was an invention of the Arab Jewish eternal hatred. And I, I, I don't know if you saw it, but I modify the Muslim for the Arab here. Because, because there was a change of narrative. During the Cold War, understanding the Muslim for the Arab, and now the Muslim came back. Why I'm saying this? This eternal hatred has been invented because right now, the West is seeing itself as the arbitrator. I'm going to argue here is for us to stop thinking that there are two sides of the problem and saying that there are many more sides, okay, but at least there is a third, a third side, as Hill Hodgeberg said very well, that is too big to be seen. And this is 
the one that always appear there in the middle, whoever the US president is. This is a little bit of a narrative about how it happened in 1956, you know, in the Suez crisis, Israel with allied itself with Western powers, and there's going to be an exodus of Muslim countries. In 1967, there's going to be an emergence of a new narrative about the possibility of a new Holocaust that led to the great uh, waves of Jewish youth to be uh, to enroll in uh, an hegemonic Zionist project, which was, has not been the case before. Jews were engaged with different problems. Between the 70s and, 70s and 90s, in the context of the Cold War, you know, uh, the, uh, Israel and Palestine were represented, represented the two sides of the Cold War. But I would say between, in the 2000s, especially in the 2010s and on, young generation of Jews start to interrogate the present. And this interrogation with the present has to do with the reclamation of political subjectivity beyond Zionism as the only Jewish political project. In this way, the idea of eternal enmity might be slowly falling apart. And I will finish with two slides uh, because I am more interested to engage with you than to talk all the time by myself. I will talk about some paradoxes and later on conclusions. Two slides, I am done, I promise. The first one is paradox about Muslims. The narrative of eternal enmity presents Muslims as intolerant fanatics or terrorists when the historical relation with Jews actually show the opposite. What is particularly interesting and groundbreaking for me is that it seems that the Jewish state requires to negate the sovereignty of Palestinians, where in the past, Muslim rule was the guarantee for Jewish survival against the duress of Christianity. Make sense? So things are turned here in a very weird way. Many Jews survived because of Islamic rule, but now there is a need for Jewish survival, according to the narrative, there is a need for Jewish survival by negating the possibility of Muslim sovereignty. Second, Jews, among them myself, who have been persecuted by Western Christianity, finish in a few decades, we want it or not, we agree or not, represented a Western Judeo-Christian tradition adapting the salvation through the same nation state that the formation that led in Europe to their attempt of annihilation during the Holocaust, but not only. But protests, disengagements, and return to other political projects are becoming slowly a true option, especially among younger generations, people who have more hair than me and less belly than myself. So with this I'm trying to say is that there has been a paradox in history in which we need to get out. And the first one is to interrogate that Zionism can be the only expression of Jewish political power. I will not negate that for some people it might be important, okay? I, I let's debate it. But for me, what is important is that the problem of Israel is not its exceptionality. The problem of Israel is its ordinarity. Israel is behaving like a Western nation state. And that is a problem. So it's just most of the time the narratives go to, you know, to attack the exceptionality. I'm saying, well, actually, no, it's the ordinarity. The ordinarity of trusting in the same system that tries to annihilate you in order to save you. And finally, Christians. If it is true what I express, and you can contradict me, you know, like I am, as I say, I'm not a historian, so I, I do some selective, politically directed kind of readings. If it is true what I said, and this enmity was constructed with Western Christians for political power, today, strangely, Western Christians present themselves as the rational actor that is a moderator and the one in charge of finding the solution. 
okay? Uh, I just like an expression of Hatem Basian that most of you know here, who said that it's not the responsibility of people who suffer the West to create public policy for the West. You know, public policy is not our issue, okay? But this is what they are trying to do. The people who created the problem are trying to solve it. And by default, that is just not going to work well because the intentions might be something else. And Christian Palestinians, some of them who have joined the project of Western nation states, but some of them who are resisting among other Palestinians, are only being brought when they need to be safe. But most of the time, their voices are completely hidden. And finish with this, some lessons. The Jewish Muslim eternal enmity is a colonial fabrication that follows, first of all, European and later on American geopolitical interventions. And incorporation, and this incorporates normative Jews to the process to construct a post Holocaust Judeo Christian tradition, including the Judeo Islamic. Today, the instrumentalization of anti Semitism post October 7, and I will never, ever, ever negate the existence of anti Semitism. Anti Semitism is a structural issue. Many Jews are suffering. But I am going to distinguish between what is anti Semitism and what the instrumentalization of anti Semitism. So, the instrumentalization of anti Semitism post October 7, for example, in the US Congress hearings, show both the pinnacle of this narrative of Jewish incorporation, but also the crudeness of this imperial strategy. Now, everything is there. We have some of the worst reactionary anti Semites accusing people in Congress, others for being anti Semitic. Okay? And that shows that the instrumentalization of this discourse of anti Semitism has been finally taken over by the Judeo Christian tradition and has absolutely nothing to do with Jews. Well, the question is always whether ever anti Semitism has to do with Jews. But at least right now, the struggle against anti Semitism has nothing to do with Jews. Now, there is a struggle of anti Semitism important, but the struggle we see today has nothing to do with Jews. Third, fourth, or something like that. Uh, <laughs> you know, third, how this story, the, the, the story I try to put together, better or worse, can change our perception of what's at stake for example, in current events in Israel and Palestine. Why keep insisting on narratives that reproduce the system through eternal hatred instead of interrogating it? Fourth, I think, Western interventions are not pacific and are not neutral and are not rational. They are actually the cause of the problem and is a side too big to be seen. I will call here an Uruguayan think thinker, Eduardo Galeano, who once was asked if you could talk to the US president, what, what you would ask to, for, uh, and uh, he, he, what is he, of course, offers help, help, what you would say, please stay away. So, the, U the European and US intervention is not about creating peace, but actually profiting of the situation. There is the side which is own interest that is a side that is too big to be seen. And finally, whatever size we are seeing in the current conflict should be divorced from identities. Not because identities don't matter. I will be the last one saying this, presenting myself as someone doing Jewish studies. But because the borders have always been porous. And because Whenever Christian, the West Christian aggregates owning the right path, we need to start thinking a little bit, where is our loyalty? Whether or not our loyalty is with the people we think are our people, or with certain kind of principles of honoring the humanity of the others. This is an alternative history. I did not present as an archive historian everything. I want to be honest with you. I did not. 
But I really hope that this at least start to almost like a guerrilla methodology, start to implode certain core and certain key aspects of what is understood as a Jewish Muslim enmity to start doing this from someone else. So thank you so much for your patience and really look forward to the conversation.